Thank you. And thank you, the Venerable <coughs> Sita Guru Siddhartha. Um, this has been a wonderful experience. It almost seems like it's been a lifetime. I can't believe we just met yesterday. But that's always an important metric, is that we feel like we've known each other for a long time, and that we have much work to do. That that can be a little daunting, but I think it's also exciting. So I'm grateful uh, to the Sita Guru International Buddhist Academy, the Catholic Bishops Conference, uh, Myanmar Council of Churches, and to the Judson Research Center at the Myanmar Institute for Theology, uh, all and the staffs of all of these organizations. Without them, none of this could have happened. And it was an immense amount of work and emails across 12 time zones sometimes, and lots of um, all fun, to be sure, but all details that were worked out. And I'm grateful for each and every person on the staffs that made this happen. Um, yesterday we started out with a, a, a proposition that our world needs uh, countries that have constitutions and citizens that celebrate, not tolerate, our deepest differences and policies that integrate, not assimilate, uh, as in, in terms of building uh, internal cohesion. And to do that, we postulated an idea that there had to be a safe and sacred space to bring people together where people of different theological points of departure and philosophies could contribute to a common moral framework. And a spiritual architecture could emerge that could address any issue in the safe space. And I think that that is what we've begun to do. And in that safe space, we are trying to live in a state of reconciliation. This is a global issue, it's a Myanmar issue, it's a regional issue. And that state of reconciliation is where peace and justice, embrace and truth and mercy kiss. This is what we're trying to do. And if at that intersection, in that safe space, we have to learn better how to love one another. And as has been said in so many different ways and, and from so many different theological contexts, let me summarize it this way, or two ways. One is that you cannot love somebody unless you oh, yeah. love them in a language and logic that they understand. Oh, yeah. You're right. Otherwise, it's not love. If I love my brothers and sisters on the stage in an American way, and they don't relate to that, that's not love. I have to understand them and walk in their shoes in order to love them in a language and logic that they understand. And love has to be practical. I gave you an acronym yesterday that I have tried to, to, we have tried to apply in our organization. Listen, observe, verify, engage. In almost all of those actions, uh, there's very little speaking. It's important to listen and observe and understand the patterns of the world and how things are coming together. So we've talked about building this practical space, I want to conclude by listing in no particular order the ideas that I've heard. At the end of the day, ideas are just ideas unless they are implemented. They have to be funded and they have to be implemented and there has to be a strategic plan. And I can't say that enough. This is my former military side coming out now. You have to walk the ground in the cold light of day to get from point A to point B. You have to get the job done with what you have. Don't make excuses, don't blame inputs, make inputs and get it done. And that is what religious leaders have to do most of all. They have to speak prophetically into that sacred space and influence the rest of society when there is no leadership to be found. It's a general comment on all countries and all political leaders these days. So here are the ideas that I have heard as we move from talk to trust, to tangible action. Maybe we need a religion and rule of law conference. Maybe Peshawar University could be a site for, to bring parties from Rakhine to experience the Buddhist traditions of Peshawar and Central Asia and talk in that context about peace and security and coexistence. Maybe Mindanao should be that place where we do religion and rule of law. Maybe Mindanao is where women of faith come together 
and demonstrate how they contribute and their values contribute to public policy and literacy and health and the environment and all those kinds of things. Maybe we need track 1.5 mediation teams where government and religious leaders are working together to preempt or react quickly to situations before they become an international black eye that stains all of Myanmar. We're actually working on such a, a program with the government in Laos right now, presenting them with a proposal based on several, the last year of uh, mutual consultations. Religious leaders and government leaders together that deploy to a situation before it becomes a terrible situation internally and internationally. And who knows, maybe we need 1.5 councils that take on the global challenges that are taking place here in Myanmar. I'm thinking of sex trafficking. That's a huge issue. AIDS with that, drugs that come with that. They're interrelated, that's a labor issue. Maybe there has to be councils that address that. I don't know, these are suggestions, they're not even recommendations. This is what I've heard as I've listened to you and learned from you these past two days. Uh, we need train the trainers efforts. Whatever we do, we have to train our folks intra-faith, within the faith, and then between faiths. What is the best of your tradition? What does it say? Another idea is this, which I think is, is a long-term thing, but it is fundamental. Maybe we should be reading our scriptures side by side. What do our holy scriptures say about loving the other? And comparing the actual scriptures with each other, and recognizing and respecting the irreconcilable theological difference. There was talk of um, Dr. Mio Mient. I, I thought this was fantastic. He, he suggested the idea of, of a strategic engagement plan across ministries. The religious affairs ministry, the cultural ministry, and I think he mentioned one other. Um, that is a very inter interesting idea. Another idea is what if the international delegation went back to our respective countries and began relationships with the local <coughs> embassy of Myanmar and found ways where we could tell the story of what we've experienced, not as proxies of Myanmar government, but because we want to speak with integrity about a story that is not being told. Are there ways for us to be ambassadors of Myanmar back in our countries? I think that's a good conversation to have. Last few points. The idea of a commission of some kind, that of course is a very sensitive issue, but sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but that is something that should be discussed. And religious leaders should have something to say about that. <coughs> Whether it should be done and when it should be done, and most importantly, how it should be done. A comprehensive study of education and how it is implemented and what is taught and how does it contribute to social cohesion, especially history. This is true of every country in the world. Your future runs through your past. And if there's a poverty of, the, of your history, it will be a threat to your future. We all have this problem. It's also a challenge. We need to think it through collectively. And then lastly, perhaps the most practical, we need to make sure that the venerable Thitigu Siadao is on the cover of Time Legacy. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, we, we can, I don't know if we can make that happen, but uh, we have to tell the story that there is a different face of Buddhism and that it is not a threat and that we should all feel comfortable and welcome within that context of the majority faith in this country. We have experienced it here, we know it to be true, and now we are accountable to tell that story, as Dr. Keebler said. With that, I conclude and thank you again. <laughs>